Welcome to the Create and Grow podcast. I am so happy to have you here. It is Jeanine Letford, your host, and we are doing our episode live today, and I'm excited to bring on our guests. But first, I just want to let you know a few things happening over at the Cafe Strategies area. We are launching our next book. Are we having a book launch in March uh, in Los Angeles? So if you're around, it is our book called The Power of I Am. And it is celebrating this book and 10 years of Alumni 360. That is a nonprofit group that I started 10 years ago with the graduates of my elementary school. We were talking about financial literacy creative literacy, entrepreneurship, and I'll show a little bit of snippets about um, our group and what we've been doing. These are students that I've known since they were five, six, seven years old, and now they are taking names, doing great, and some of them are in college, some of them are done with college, some of them are in the workforce, just really being the thought leaders who we have raised them to be. So we're celebrating the 10-year anniversary of Alumni 360. We'll show you a little bit more about that later on in the show and the book launch of The Power of I Am in March. But we're selling and uh, celebrating another book launch today and talking about all things creativity. For those of you who know my work, we are looking at intercultural creativity and neurosomatic creativity. What does it mean to be creative and be mindful of the cultural lenses and mindful of the brain-mind-body connection? But I'm bringing to the stage a creativity expert, someone who I met early in my journey of entrepreneurship when I first launched from the classroom to really start this mission and let me bring her to the stage. Hi, Anne. I mean, it's so great to be here, and I'm so proud of you, and congrats on your book launch. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, hopefully, I'll, I'll be able to show a few Im images later, but we're here to talk about you and your amazing book. So let me just introduce you, and then you can fill us in, and let's just have a great conversation on a topic that is or needs to be very top of mind of everyone from the smallest infant being born today to the elderly in, in the homes and in their own homes, everyone, zero, I say from zero to 125, right? And everyone in between. Jacob. And Jacoby, is, am, am I saying your last name correct? Jacoby, it's okay. Jacoby, thank you. I was like, I haven't said it in about four years. So <laughs> when I first met you. And, and Jacoby, uh, you were on a mission to basically cultivate cultivate creativity at work. And I love that. And we'll talk about that. And you're a professional performer, which I love that as well. We're going to dig into that. <laughs> turned MBA. I wouldn't say turned, but you're a professional performer. You wrote turned MBA entrepreneur, but it seems like I just think you're just it all. Right. And you have been building businesses and helping other people build their businesses and driving positive culture change within organizations for over 20 years, two decades. Wow. You are the CEO and founder of the culture consul consultancy called Spring Street. Yes. And your new book, which I have here, thank you so much for sending it to me, is called Born to Create. Mm. Born to Create. I have my copy in my hand and we're going to talk about why everyone listening needs to get their copy in their hand when it is launched in, in a few weeks. Your book, Born to Create, shares how you can apply creativity to spark connection, innovation, and belonging in our new world of work. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Janine. It's great to be here. So let's just start. I remember you were sharing a post that really tugged at my heart. Your daughter, and how old is, is she now? Nine now. Yeah. Nine. And her name again? Caroline. Yeah. So Ca Caroline was getting in the car with you, I think going, going from school to home. And she was like, mom, I just, I just need, you know, a moment. I'm not ignoring you or anything, but I'm just going to take this time and just look out the window. And like, she gave you a heads up yeah. that she needed time to be in her default mode network. Mm -hmm. A lot of my work, and I believe some of your work is really getting people back to their childlike imagination, curiosity, creativity le levels. Yeah. And I love that story because it was a child, right? This, I think she was maybe seven, seven-ish or six-ish or so. Yeah. Telling you and whoever else was in the car and telling the world, <laughs> this default mode network time is more important than 
we know. So let's start to, get to, 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 to get back um, there. Go for it. Oh, well, I thank you for remembering that story, Janine. And I just got goosebumps as you retold the story. I think a lot of us think that today, especially in the workplace, we need to be doing all the time, right? It's all about mm -hmm. productivity. We need to show what we're doing. And I remember a lawyer friend of mine saying uh, she was at a law firm and and they said, basically, stop thinking. You're not paid to think. You're paid to to produce, right? But the thinking and the, imagine, the imaginative space, kind of that default network that you, you just referred to, is so powerful in activating the, the pathways to, to lead us to that innovation, to lead us to the mm -hmm. insights and the great advice we're going to give to our clients, right? If we don't yeah. allow ourselves that space to really settle into that, that deep work, to get into our flow, well, goodness, I mean, we're, we're just going to be dissatisfied with our work. We're going to feel like we're on the rat race. We're in this little hamster wheel and we're not going to create and, and flourish our, all of our great ideas um, in the capacity that, that we have. So uh, mm -hmm. I'm so glad that you remembered that. My daughter is still, um, you know, definitely an imagination, you know, has a, a big imagination, loves being in that story mode. But I think we all deserve to, to grace ourselves with that time mm -hmm. to imagine. Yes, yes. And I love that. And if you could just give the audience just a little bit about who you are and how you got to be where you are today, that, that, that'd be great. Yeah, thank you, Janine. So a um, little background on me. I thought I would be a singer, actor, dancer, right? I had done that as a little kid. I went to the high school for the arts in Los Angeles and studied music and studied theater at Northwestern and uh, thought I would make a career of it. And I ended up joining a startup in New York City in the early 2000s. And that's really where my aha moment of, oh my goodness, all this creativity that I have been practicing and cultivating as a performer really does apply in our workspaces. And to build a business, to be an entrepreneur, um, to bring a new product to market, you need to activate your creative muscles, right? It's a skill, it needs to be mm -hmm. practiced. And so now kind of fast forward 20 years, I help other organizations to activate those those creative juices, the creative chemistry among their group to, to basically drive business results. And we see that more creativity in the workplaces leads to more fulfilled teams, um, mm -hmm. stronger connection, more innovation, and a, a higher sense of belonging in the workplace. Yes, yes. And of course, you know, I actually want to start start there where you said you were in, in the arts and then saw the connection there, right? And a part of my life's purpose now, right, I, I can do this for the next 40 years, is proving to corporate America and reproving to K-12, right, and pre-K-12, that the arts are a part of the lived experience. And creativity isn't only artistry, it's, a, it's everything else, but artistry can help you be more creative in non-arts areas. Mm. Did you want to expand upon, upon that? Like, how do you feel that your arts background, because you studied art, like I didn't go to a high school, like, <laughs> yeah. you know, just for, for the arts. So that's some in, intense training. How do you feel or what key transfer skills do you feel came over because of your intense study in the arts during your developmental years? Yeah, I'm so glad you asked that. And I think a lot of times, whether it's the arts or um, folks who are really focused on uh, sports discipline, you know, training for the Olympics, that kind of rigor and discipline really does translate to other spaces. And my experience was going to this arts high school where we're bringing together people from different backgrounds, different experiences, different um, socioeconomic backgrounds, and and really diving into their craft, focusing so intensely, but also freeing our, our minds up to collaborate. I mean, I learned collaboration from those experiences at LOXA, LA County High School for the Arts, because people were uh, you know, bringing what they had, bringing their talent, bringing their craft, bringing their, their love and passion for, for the arts. And we got to build something better together. And I think that skill really does translate to our workspaces as well. Yes. And if you look at the, the list of the 21st essential skills, right? I just met a woman named Dr. Laura Jana, and she has a wonderful TED, TED talk, uh, which I, I highly rec recommend it. But she talks about the essential skills and how we can bring them out in the school day, right? So curiosity, um, collaboration, creativity, uh, what are the other ones? Resilience, right? All, all of these 
skills we're definitely you and I are, are out there training adults on, you yes. know, like how how do how do they show up in just artistic experiences and artistic develop development? And your principal art was in which I was, area? I was a vocalist and then I ended okay. up in theater. So really singing, acting, dancing, uh, really the combination. All of it. Those things, all those things. Yeah. Storytelling. Yes. <laughs> yes. And now, you know, I, I heard someone else. What did, what did she say? Well, Dr. Amy Edmondson, she had a webinar last week that, that I sat in on and she, she, you know, the one who coined the phrase psychological safe safety. She's over at Har Harvard, Harvard, I think. Yeah. She was talking about, you know what? She said two words, curiosity and self-awareness curiosity and self where she kept saying those. So I was like, yes, Ann and I are on the right track, you know, <laughs> but how do you uh, bring in, you know, what are some of the fun things you do when you go to corporations to, to help them build this curiosity, self-awareness and collaboration? Yeah. I mean, so, so grateful that you mentioned the element of safety, because I think mm -hmm. if you, if you imagine a team, if they do not feel safe to experiment, to try new things, to take risks with each other, if they're worried about being criticized or laughed at or uh, ridiculed or worse, you know, um, you know, if they try an idea that doesn't work out, they could get fired. Mm -hmm. I think that kind mm -hmm. of fear-based environment is what's keeping us from being our best creative selves. And so really starting with that foundation of psychological safety, building trust, um, finding a, a space where you can try new things is the foundation for any kind of creative team today. So uh, a very important element of all the work, all the scaffolding that I do with my clients. And that's really what the arts can do as well, right? If, if you have them engage in an artistic experience where no one's an expert, all right, or they just have different degrees of experience, what a great way to uh, help people to start to trust one another, you know, and, and to see that, yeah, I may be the CEO, but we're doing this together and, and I have no idea. So it almost puts everybody on the same playing field, right? Well, collaboration is a jam session. And, uh, you mm -hmm. know, I really love drawing from the wisdom of Bob Reynolds, a good friend of mine. He's also a really uh, well-known saxophone player, accomplished mm -hmm. saxophone teacher. And he talks about this element of everyone bringing the best of their craft, but then mm -hmm. being able to let go when you're together. It's not about, you know, shining in the spotlight. Sure, you'll have your moment, you'll have your solo, but it's really about the music that you're creating together that, that kind of makes it even better when you come together you collaborate, you bring your best, but it's not a competition. It's this collaboration. And I think that dynamic is really needed in the workplace. Yeah, yes, and it is. And I love your book, showing it up. <laughs> so uh, what, what page? I think this is on page 170, where you talk about, let me find, find it, um, being the conductor, right? Being the conductor and applying the culture of strategy framework. This reminds me when I went to Boston and I had a chance to sit in on a uh, closed rehearsal with Ben Zander. Do you know Ben, ben Benjamin Z Zander? Yeah. Uh, he's brilliant. And I, my principal, like when I first got into the classroom, got everyone his book. Um, all I remember is it had a yellow cover, but great, great book. The Art of Possibility, I, I believe it was called. Mm -hmm. And he has a wonderful quote that says, a great conductor understands that the power doesn't come from them, the power comes from making other people powerful. Yeah. Like the conductor doesn't say a word. And if you and if you watch a, a closed session, the most of the work is done behind the scenes before the show even, even the show days is even there, right? You know, as an artist, you know this. The that's when the work with the conductors yeah. is going on. But the performance, the people see the conductor making other people powerful. So how does that connect to your uh, chapter uh, called Be the Conductor, Applying the Culture Strategy Framework for Creative Thinking in, in Teams? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's so interesting. I think a lot of people leaders in particular feel like, oh, the culture is, is up to me. Uh, right. I'm, I'm responsible for the culture and everyone's performance is, is kind of falling on my shoulders. And it's not really not the case, whether you're the leader of, of a particular division, whether you're the leader of the entire organization, your job is to be kind of the conductor, um, helping bring out the best in other people and let their instruments shine. Uh, and I think that skill, that ability to nurture and develop the best in others is really what leaders are today. Great leaders are born from that that notion of I'm going to bring out the best. I'm going to uh, ensure that we're all playing well together. And that's what's going to make a beautiful piece at the end. Uh, it's going to create, create a great company. 
Yeah, there's so many people using the metaphor of music or the metaphor of the arts. There's uh, I spoke with Dr. Nat Natalie Nixon, right? And she ah. she's a wonderful um, keynote speaker, speaking with you. And I have um, some books. One other book I just got in the mail called uh, Two Beats ahead and it's just about these these other musicians using music as an example and so once again i think like this is our time right this is this is the time where people stop saying okay the arts are over there go over there and play with your puppets we're over here doing real work right our tps reports um <laughs> and people are understanding that it's it's a merge and i think people like you and me and people who who have this this unique experience of being in multiple worlds, not even both worlds, it's not a dichotomy, but you just like in multiple words, because you're a mother, you know, you're, you're a wife, you're an artist of many different arts, and you're a businesswoman of small businesses, and you've been in, in, in Fortune 500, you know, mm -hmm. like you, you probably go hiking, <laughs> you know, you're, you're just in so many worlds. How do you think this diversification of your experiential journey has, has helped you, um, just support some of the, the toughest problems that we have right right now. Yeah, I think it comes down to the, that adaptability and being able mm -hmm. to see patterns. You know, creative thinkers like mm -hmm. you, Janine, you're, you're able to zoom out and see the patterns and kind of notice things before maybe others do. And I think that's mm -hmm. the, the marker of creative thinker. Um, you know, I do think it comes back to story though. If you think of all the arts and if you think of really strong businesses, the similarities are they're all telling a compelling story, right? They're reaching mm -hmm. the audience in a way that's special, where you feel connected and driving that connection. Again, whether your discipline is playing an instrument or, um, you know, putting on a piece of theater or, or, you know, releasing a new product to market, it's all about what's going to move people to act or feel something. And that's what mm -hmm. we all crave as humans. And I don't care how much AI you throw at it, how much technology <laughs> disrupts or replaces humans, the human experience is, is ours. And so we really yeah. need to focus on developing that, focus on what helps us uh, connect through story. And I think that's accessible mm -hmm. through the arts and it's accessible through our businesses. Yes, yes, yes. And I love it because we were born to create. And I don't know, you know, if you were like really like locking in when your little ones were were just here. But like my my son just turned six this six this past past month oh. or past week on Wednesday. Right. Uh, Sonic the Hedgehog birthday. Oh, my goodness. And uh, <laughs> go Sonic. And um <laughs> I, I I just believe that he was born um, at the right time because you know we, we did have a little bit of a ish, issue ha having him, so we had to go through some other routes. But I was like, you know, I I thank God that he was born exactly when he was, because my my attention was mm -hmm. ripe on what does it mean to be truly creative and observant and to experience the new and experience wonder. Mm -hmm. And what a great thing to have a case study right there in your home of they're experiencing the new and they're experiencing wonder. So I was just watching him saying, okay, well, how can I better communicate what humans do automatically in their first three to five years of life? And what does that look like in the boardroom, in the workroom? Mm -hmm. And, and so how do you make, make that, um, how do you bring people back to that element of wonder? Because in the book, uh, made to stick the Heath, the Heath, the chip Heath, bro uh, the brothers, um, either made, made to stick or, or, um, another yeah it's made to stick he talks about the curse of knowledge like mm -hmm. adults just walk through life thinking they know everything so they're not paying attention to some of the new ideas well how how do you combat that when you work with your uh, teams yeah i mean gosh we learn so much from our kids right um and observing how they move through the world um i think a lot about wonder and i one vehicle that i like to use with clients and really with myself and with my family is that the device of focusing on gratitude kind of the small things that we're grateful for, uh, finding the wonder and the awe of those little, little things. Um, you know, we're, we're about to get a new dog to our family. So a puppy, Yay. It's kind of that, that sweet puppy breath, right? It's, there's just nothing like that. And appreciating that really sitting in that moment of, oh my goodness, this new being is now a part of our family. Um, <laughs> how do we celebrate that? How do we learn from this playfulness? Mm -hmm. And it's those tiny little moments that might seem small uh, in isolation, but they aggregate to something really big and something really yeah. meaningful. So we drop in, mm -hmm. we find our gratitude, um, we find that joy and playfulness, and and we appreciate the now. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think that really fuels fuels us in the workplace as well. 
and to see how even a dog looks at the world, right? There's this wonderful book called um, like 11 Ways of Walking where this woman took the same route on her walk, but she walked it with someone diff different, like a botanist or a, a musician or a two-year-old or a dog or someone in just in a different field than her or a different ethnicity or a different, just, just a different demographic. And yes. she just noticed how everyone she took that same route with mm experience the route completely different, you know, which caused her to shift her attention to what they were experiencing. And so um, I share that book in my trainings because like, how, how do we do that in our work day? Yes. You know? It's perspective taking, right? And you and I, I think have talked about that before, just kind of the power of shifting that perspective, just a notch on the dial can really open up a whole new world. And when we mm -hmm. imagine sitting in someone else's shoes and you know, experiencing the life that, that they're living, it really does inform, okay, how do we want to bring this product to market? How is that going to shift um, how we communicate about this product, right? All of it can change just by the little turning of the dial. So mm -hmm. I'm so glad that you mentioned that. Yes. Yeah, so and I'm going to bring it back to the arts. I, I want to show this small clip from Dr. David Eagleman, who's over at Stanford. Um, and he wrote Live Wire, you know, just reminding us that our brains are still changing even past that 25 year old mark. You know, people thought like your brains are done shifting <laughs> after 25. That's why your insurance goes down, right? Because <laughs> your prefrontal yeah. cortex and I don't have my brain. I have my my plushy brain that we got for our, our, our new, new book. Um, but my other brains over there. <laughs> and once again, he, he talks about, and, and I would love for you to expand upon this after, after the clip covert versus over. Mm. Right. And so let's, let's hear from Dr. David e e Eagleman and that, and I, I, I would love your uh, thoughts upon this. Let's see. Oh, wait, not that one, this one. <laughs> and the key thing is that and I'm, I'm sure this is the same in Australia. And putting art inside the maths classroom and the science classroom. Well, exactly, the exactly. The key thing is that arts are always the first thing to get cut when budgets get tight. Uh, and this is a real shame because, by the way, um, uh, just as a quick side note, there was just a study that came out in America about the socioeconomic status of different neighborhoods and how likely you are as an adult to take out a patent on something that you've invented. And it turns out you're 10 times more likely if you grow up in a wealthy neighborhood than a poor neighborhood. Now here's the important part. All kids are equally creative as proven by tests of creativity with little kids. They're all equally creative. But what happens when you grow up in a poor neighborhood is it, one of the things is that the arts are always the first thing to go. And so all you ever learn is here's the way to get to the answer in the back of the book. Here's the way to get a job and, and go. Um, the reason the arts matter is because this is where you get to do bending, breaking, and blending explicitly, overtly, as opposed to all of the stuff in the sciences, which as I mentioned is the same cognitive operations, but that's more covert. As in, you know, when you look at a cell phone, it's an incredibly ingenious rectangle of innovation, but you're not typically aware of what's in there. That's covert. But, but the arts, you just look around and there's so much terrific architecture around here that I've been enjoying today. Um, you know, that's bending, breaking and blending in various sorts of ways that you can see. And in arts class, that's what you do. You just practice that and practice that. It's like a sandbox in which you get to get good at that. All right. So what are your thoughts on that? I know I saw you nodding in the back room. <laughs> oh, yes. you know, yes. of, I am so, so thrilled that you shared that clip. It uh, makes me think of Chris Bowers, uh, who I feature in the book. He's an amazing composer, composed um, the Green Book uh, score, you know, has won incredible awards. He's just, his, his career is ascending. But he published a piece in the, New, in the LA Times um, a few weeks back talking about public art, arts education and how he had access, free access to this grand piano as a child and what an influence that made on him. And it's that accessibility that I think is really needed in our cities, um, you know, as we think about mm -hmm. the disparity that, um, that mm -hmm. the scientist, uh, you know, highlighted, we really do need to invest so that we are uh, opening up the access and especially the arts, because it is so visible, because you can touch and feel it and experience it in a way that you can't with, with other innovations, I think is incredibly powerful. Um, the other person that I thought of uh, is Robert Vargas, who's an incredible muralist, also a, a graduate of LA County High School for the Arts, and has, I think, 
you know, done this incredible mural on the side of buildings in downtown Los Angeles. Um, there's a Robert Vargas Day, incredibly accomplished visual artist. And again, it's mm -hmm. that the stuff that you can see and touch, you see how much it's changed, not only their lives, but the communities in which they serve and, and, yeah. and you know, contribute their art. So connecting that to what you do with corporations, he, he said about the disparity, you know, children who grow up in certain areas, um, they're less like, likely to take out a, a patent or, or trade trademark. And I wanted to, to touch upon that because in your, your uh, book, and let's add that I write down the page, but you talk about um, in the common creativity kill killers. And I love how you have certain areas where you pull out just different, you know, people can kind of flip to it and get a few uh, quick, quick gems. Right. Yeah. And you have just creativity killers, overthinking, like lack, lack of sleep. That's a whole other podcast right there. Right. <laughs> Diet and sleep. <laughs> yeah. We forget about our, our brain, which I did go and grab my uh, brain. Um, like our brains help need to be working well, to think creatively. So if you're not sleeping and eating right and, and moving your body, um, that affects your creative thinking. But also I wanna talk about this last one that I highlighted, encountering those with a fixed mindset. And that's where my work comes in of the, of the intercultural creativity that if you're raised in a culture, and I don't just mean ethnicity and nationality, but even your home culture or a school culture or a faith-based culture, right? Just the type of culture you're surround, you're surrounded by affects the way you think creatively and the way you see the creative potential of yourself and other peop uh, people. So yes. uh, before you talk about that, I, I want to um, give a quick example of the word found. I was reading all these books and like, oh, Dr. Martin Seligman, he founded positive psychology and this person founded that. And I was like, why can't I found something? <laughs> You know, so yeah. there's so, you know, thank goodness I went to an event where I met a trademark lawyer at CSUN and, and, and him and I became uh, friends and he came to, to speak to alumni 360 students and talk, talk to them about trademark and yeah. they got to touch um, a foam that was trademarked by him or, or whatever. And he, they got to see layouts of a trademark blueprints of, of how people turn this in. Yeah. And, and that your part in the book brought that up. It's like, if kids aren't exposed to the fact that they can found something and trademark something and patent something, then they just go work at Kmart about it for 30 years, you know? Like, so what are your thoughts about the, the influence unconscious subconscious influence of our surroundings in the workplace too not yeah. not just kk12 i think it's not only kids i think you're exactly right janine this is about uh modeling and helping people see themselves in these roles in these creative roles as an inventor as an innovator right we have this idea mm -hmm. of this um you know mad scientist usually an older white man, right? Who has invented something, but it's so- By, by himself, right? <laughs> by himself, exactly, no other help or anything. Um, but I also talk in the book about the IP program at Pure Storage and how they have consciously gone out of their way to focus on inclusive innovation and to help their entire workforce see themselves as innovators, whether that's you know creating a patent or not, coming up with new ideas, um, you know, really focusing on the business value and seeing themselves in those spaces, uh, regardless of background and what you look like and what age you are. I mean, it's so powerful when organizations can do that culturally uh, and really promote those shifts in mindset and obliterate the fixed mindset, but really go actively promoting this is what innovation can look like today. And it's not what it was yesterday. So powerful. So yeah, and what we see, right? And and I'm looking to expand that from fixed mindset to growth mindset, the work of Carol Dweck, but looking at what does a prismatic mindset look like? So going off of the concept, you know me, I'm always making stuff up, right? <laughs> so, you're, a founder, so going, you're a founder. <laughs> so going off the concept of a, a, a prism, that's the work of prismatic leadership. You know, like, like a prism can, can reveal the hidden colors that are already there in light. You're just, you're just revealing what's already there. And a prismatic leader is able to do that for themselves and for their team members. But how do we have a prismatic mindset, right? Where we're just not revealing our inner greatness and all the cool things we can do, but we can spot it in, in those around us and then help them develop that. Like what if the company that you're, you're talking about, 
they actually had a program where they walk people through, here's how you patent an idea. That's right. You know, um, here's how you you do the trademark or, or whatever. Here's how you write a book <laughs> about your idea. Exactly. Yes, you know? it's really um, there's a lot to admire about that organization. And um, one of their core values won't surprise you is creativity. So they're they're really consciously uh, putting it into action, which is so admirable, I think. Uh, but we can all do that in our lives. We can do that in how we think about opportunities and, well, gosh, who might lend a different perspective and how can I collaborate with that person? Uh, you know, it really does take some intention sometimes, but building that kind of connection, that collaboration, I think makes the end product that much better and richer for the, for the consumer. Yes. Yes. And there's one issue that I want your take on that I've been, um, you know, asked several times from different interviewers and companies is what do you do when you have that manager where there's, a, you know, there's a team of 10 and with two people there, there's a disconnect mm -hmm. and, or, or, or with all of them, there's a disconnect, you know, you just have that middle area that it's, it's really, um, stopping creative ideas from, from flourishing, you know, like you, you spoke about fear before, but from getting to where power can actually do something with the idea, what type of advice do you give people just dealing with um, conflict and the managerial plug? <laughs> yeah, they can be creative blockers even without knowing it. And we all know those people, right, Janine? It's like, um, they think that they're there to kind of promote the ideas, but they end up squashing most of the ideas. Mm -hmm. and I, I mm -hmm. highlight in the book another um, really great leader, Aaron Mitchell, who talks about his experience at Netflix and how an idea just wasn't quite ready yet. So mm -hmm. the idea kind of bubbled up to the executive. Uh, the executive said no. And then Aaron coached and helped uh, shape this idea into something that would get a yes. And so a lot of times mm -hmm. it's about, okay, the no might be a not yet. And having mm -hmm. that resilience, having that tenacity to say, okay, I'll take the no, I'm going to refine it, I'm going to learn from it, I'm going to adjust it, and then I'm going to try again. It really does take yeah. a lot of effort um, sometimes to shape a really great idea, um, because it's just not ready yet. It doesn't it hasn't landed mm -hmm. on the right ears, it hasn't um, been shaped in a way that will feel accessible and, uh, and get the yes. So I think it's about mm -hmm. adapting as you go. Any creator will probably say that's just part of the creative process. Yes, yes. But you get to experience that in, in, in the arts, right? You know, when you choreograph a dance and you're trying to communicate an idea or a message, right? It's like you you get that draft out and then you're then you gotta do it again. You walk through it, you you know, like when we do our speeches, like, oh, that that didn't transfer well or the emotion didn't 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 go over well to that next part. What what can I what can I switch? So it's like life is life is a draft. <laughs> Sometimes it feels like, right? I feel like trademark yeah. that. Yes. I mean, it's all about it's about the reps, right? And it's about getting mm -hmm. the feedback and being okay with taking the note and really mm -hmm. digesting it and learning from it. Um because nothing is ever perfect, you know. It, it's yeah. just that is that is a futile effort. Uh, we're just not mm -hmm. going to be perfectionists. It's all about getting the ideas out there, getting the feedback from the audience. You know, as a former performer, uh, no no two audiences are the same. They're going to latch on to different things. The joke's going to land a little bit differently on one night versus the next. And so you really have to be attuned to the energy and shape mm -hmm. it as you go. And that's part of the fun of it. That's the co-creative process. Is yeah. Um, continuing to adapt based on what the audience's energy is giving you. And adaptability, a 21st century skill, right? And storytelling and storytelling, because I like I do virtual presentations, but I, I do tell the people like, I love to see the faces because when I just am talking to a screen, I, I see no emotional like, <laughs> it's so I can do it. I just don't prefer, <laughs> prefer that it's, oh, that's like the, the worst because you and me, like we're very like energetic, you know, we, we move. And I honestly feel that our arts background helps us be better presenters yeah. and facilitators, you know. Yeah, I hope so. I hope it's uh, <laughs> there's a little bit of entertainment value there. <laughs> Who knows? We'll, we'll get some we'll, tomatoes thrown at us now, but <laughs> we'll try. Well, just because well, how the brain learns. I, I've had several people come. It's like, thank you for not lecturing me for three hours and just having me sit there. Thank you for your interactiveness. And yeah. I just, you know, we just bring bring it a, a different way with a, diff with a different style. Yeah, yeah, I hope so. <laughs>
Awesome. Awesome. So um, I wanted to show this other clip about just the importance of mo movement and, and dance and what it does to the brain. So going back to how we first op opened the show with your daughter saying, you know, she needed to be in her default mode network time, which just means she needed to think to herself, kind of go in, in inward. Mm -hmm. Um when you're improvising and, and you can talk about that after the clip, what does improv improvisation do for the creative process in the workplace? Yeah. What does that look, look like? Um, we know improvisation musically, you know, um, but all, and also with, with dance and theater, right. All those improvisational games, what does that look like in the workplace? But here's why it's, it's good um, to Im 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 improvise with movement. Running doesn't lend itself to a lot of novel forms of movement, lateral movement. So, so for you nerds out there, movement in the sagittal plane um, or angled movements. But it does appear that things like dance or sports where you end up generating a lot of dynamic movements, where there's jumping, where there's movement at different angles, where there's ducking, where there's leaping, that basically involve a lot of dynamic movement and aren't just strictly linear. Those seem to open the portals for plasticity. And that's because they mimic a lot of the brain circuitry that is associated with play. And the reason for that is the way in which those dynamic movements and movements of different speeds engage the vestibular system, the balance system. The vestibular system is in the inner ear, relates to the cerebellum, which translates to mini brain. You got a little mini brain in the back of your brain. It brings together visual information in a very direct way. I talked a lot about this in the episode on how to learn faster. So if you want to go in depth on how vestibular and different types of motor movements can open plasticity. I talk a little bit more, or I should say a lot more there. But suffice to say that engaging in a play that has a lot of dynamic movement or movements of different speeds, things like dance, things like sports, like soccer, where you're moving in different dimensions, that tends to be very conducive to what we would call play-related circuitry. All right. So, well, thoughts about improvisation. How do you get people moving through improv scenarios at, at work? Not yeah. that they have to be doing like ballet dance or anything. <laughs> <laughs> Bring on the ballet. I love that. Um, I, I, gosh, what a great clip. First of all, love that clip. Uh, and I do think that there's something about really being comfortable in our bodies and noticing how we're feeling in our bodies first. It's such a powerful device in, in the coaching work that I do. Um, you know, kind of listening to those cues is really important. But mm -hmm. uh, in terms of improv, gosh, role playing a difficult conversation or role playing, um, you know, gosh, how are we going to approach this big high stakes meeting? I mean, that is where the good stuff happens. It's in those rehearsal mm -hmm. spaces uh, that we can really come up with new ideas. We are more inventive. We feel safe, hopefully, with our colleagues to to play around and try things that maybe we wouldn't in front of the actual client, right? Yeah. Um, and, and so in my work, I really apply a lot of those principles and it's all about improv. It's all about uh, co-creating together and it, mm -hmm. it leads to better outcomes. Uh, yes, yes. And we are telling the the world, the nation for sure, and corporate that this is, I believe this is the way of this next de decade. Of course, we know AI is come, coming in. That's There's no discussion there. Uh, I just got off a phone call. He was like, Janine, you need to create your av avatar and start doing keynotes with your avatar. I'm like, what? <laughs> He's like, yes, in two years, you'll be doing most of your income maybe coming through your avatar keynotes. I'm like, Amazing. Okay, here, here we go. Um, and, and, and so just keeping that in mind, but I believe a lot of the work that you and I, I do, especially if, if you're bringing in the arts is reminding people what it means to be human mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and creativity. We know robots can be cr creative, meaning they, they can be art artistic. You know, I have a v footage of one like drawing <laughs> or something and we know AI can make music compositions and they can write books apparently. Now you have to put on your book. This book was not written, by the way, this book was not written from AI. This was- <laughs> It certainly was not. It wouldn't have taken me four years if it had been. <laughs> All right. Yes. Um, so, but but what does it mean to live a colorful, hum, human, humanistic life? You know, to really feel, and I love that that in that introceptive ability of feeling how you're feeling throughout yeah. life and tapping in to that. How do you? Because I know you work with with C suite le leaders, like like and people who deal with titles and power, and what that what power does to the brain, yeah, and how it affects observational. Um, 
just abilities, what are your what what are some of your top tips with, for your senior leaders out there to incorporate the main gems? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I do think it's about really being self aware, right? And and knowing yourself really well, starting with the self. Um, you know, being clear about your purpose. I talk a lot about the concept of purpose and North Star and Ikigai in the book, um, how important it is to to take those extra steps to really get to know yourself and and know that, well, maybe I've been told all, all across my career that this is the title that I want, but is that really the lifestyle that I want? Um, mm-hmm. And I, I know a lot of leaders who are wrestling with that. You know, they, um, they've achieved great things, but they, they want something more. And so what does that look like? And kind of peeling yeah. back the layers there. So Um, You know, I do think we're entering a new era in work, and my hope is that with greater awareness, with these tools, we can create the kind of life that we each want to live, and that, you know, knowing that we have that capacity is so powerful, Um, apart from any title or, you know, uh, career or salary, it's really about uh, what do I want to do in this world? We get this one chance to do that, and let's make the most of it. Uh, very well said. And that reminds me of something my father said to me um, before he uh, passed, passed, passed on. He was like, you know, and, and I was starting my my teaching career and working with kids. He was like, Janine, you look like you're doing what you really want to do. You know, you you look like you're in it. And to be so young and have found that so early in life, like you you have no idea how special that is because sometimes people they it it doesn't happen if it happens at all um right. till till the sunset years but to really and i was like kind of like what i'm doing now like i i won't do it for free ladies and gentlemen i do like to get paid but i would do this for 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 free like to go and teach people through the arts and through movement how to be self aware creative interculturally connect how to speak well how to story tell how to influence masses of of people to follow you and not have to instill fear in, in them, but instill inspiration. Like I love this stuff. Um, yeah. and the fact that people pay me for it, that's even better, you know, and I get to travel. Um, and uh, I get to, to like, what, what do you think about your, cause your topic is, is applicable for every field. Right. And I'm pretty sure you find yourself in like healthcare, kind of like me, I've, I've done healthcare, finance, education, just because I have an education background. Mm-hmm. Um, I just, my, my, my partner and I just came back from teaching at the Cherokee Nation to beautiful people who are, who are bringing the Cherokee language um, back to, to their, 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 their young ones and, and their, their students. And yeah. I mean, 10 years ago, if you told me I, I would be doing that, I'd be like, wait, what? You know, yeah. so how do you, continue to connect the dots because you're in so many fields doing this, this work. Yeah. And that's, that's part of the joy. I mean, you and I are probably mm-hmm. similarly wired in that where we're, we're curious, right? We want to learn we want to expose ourselves to new environments and that's what keeps it fresh. If I yeah. were just working with one cookie cutter problem, I would, that would get pretty old for me. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's the diversity of, of needs and interests and, um, and different industries and, different dynamics within the workplace that really fuel me to keep coming back and think, oh, how are we going to address this? Right. How yes. Are we yes. Like, this particular hmm. problem? Um, and it's, it, it keeps it fresh and, and that's what mm-hmm. keeps the creative juices flowing. So uh, yeah. I find great, great fulfillment in the work that I do as well. And I'm so thrilled Janine that you, you found this path when you did. I'm so grateful that our paths have, have collided many times and I hope we'll continue to do so because yeah. this work is so meaningful. And when you and I see the change, not only to the workplace, but to people's lives, I think that mm-hmm. that just um, confirms that we're on the right track here. Ah, yes. Yes. So good. And I don't know if you're busy March 16th, but you're more than welcome to to join us for our uh, celebration of Alumni 360. And I definitely want you to be able to share about your Barnes and Noble book signing. I'm like, hey, she's at the Grove. What? What? She's at the Grove. If you are at the Grove, can you share with our audience what that is about and when and where they can find your your book? Yes, yes. So the book launches on February 20th, which is next Tuesday. Um, pick up a copy. You can pre-order your copy on Amazon or Barnes & Noble. Um, and yes, there is an event at the Barnes & Noble at the Grove in Los Angeles at 7 o'clock on Thursday, February 22nd. So for those who are local in Los Angeles, I would love to see you there. It's a free event. It's going to be a lot of fun. There might be some special people in the audience. Um, and uh, we'll do a little book signing. It'll be fun. Ah. 
uh, should I make the trip? Can I can I pull it off? <laughs> oh, that that would have been awesome. <laughs> that would have been awesome, awesome. And so uh, before we we wrap up, you have um, just something in the book on one hundred page one hundred twelve called "Learn It All: Why We Need to Be a Learn It All." Yeah. And and what what are some gem like how like what's one or two things that people can can enact today implement today to be a learn learn it all what does that yeah. mean to you yeah so that was borrowed from Satya Nadella the CEO of Microsoft who really came in and transformed Microsoft's culture by focusing on being a learn it all instead of a know it all and I think in business today we really do need to focus on that curiosity. The, the thirst for learning. And that requires trying things that are not going to be so great. They're going to be, I hate to use the word failure, but they're going to be missteps. They're going to be things that are not perfect. And when we adopt that growth mindset that you've been talking about, that's where we shift mm -hmm. our perspective. Uh, we focus on the learning and then we can continue to create to make something even better next time. Yes, yes. And we do have a few um, watching live. So if you have any questions for her, please put them in the chat. We will def definitely uh, share share them. Because I did have a, a question for you. I know the term VUCA, which is volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. And I also know the term BANI, because I know people were trying to move away from VUCA, which is from uh, the military background. And it was okay for that time. But they said we're in a BANI world, which stands for brittle, anxious, nonlinear, and incomprehensible, right? I know, but you in the book talk about the term. Tuna? That tuna. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what is tuna? I mean, I know I know what tuna means to me, my cultural lens. You know, like, um, But what is tuna to you <laughs> in <Yeah>. this book? <laughs> yes. Tumultuous, uncertain, novel, ambiguous world. So mm. it's, a, it's a neighbor to VUCA. Um, you pick your acronym, right? Um, I think it's, there's a lot of uncertainty nowadays. And I think we see that with the the volatility in, in the workplace, in the market, in um, just the feeling of stability. It's, you know, we're all fragmented. A lot of us are part of virtual teams, global teams, which is both exciting, but it can be unsettling. And so finding a skill like creativity that can really unite us and bring us together and foster connection. I think that's what our workplaces are really thirsty for. And, and hopefully there are some tools in this book um, that leave us better off. Yeah, workplaces that allow the creativity to help foster connection, right? Yeah, that's um, right. Yes, and workplaces that understand how to help people develop that because people are all coming in with different levels of creative com competence due, due to their childhood and different experiences and their own identity of how they view their own creative efficacy, basically, right? And so good leaders really know how to develop that and how to um, basically shift and be adaptable with, with their team members. So definitely this is a guide. And before we, we just hear your final thoughts, your final gems, I just want to remind everyone that uh, Anne has her, her book signing at February 22nd at The Grove in Los Angeles. Please go tell them I sent you. <laughs> um, <laughs> and go go support her. So I definitely will have to probably um, push this up and make make sure um, it, it it airs before then. Um, and then we do have the book launch of I Am, and I'll be doing a diff different different. Uh, show on that of showing the illustrations from a new illustrator, Victoria Map Mappala. This is her first uh, children's inner child's book. And it's just a book of declarations. Like I am creative. I am wise. I am confident. I am compassionate. And uh, lastly, we do have, of course, My Brain, My Brain, My Beautiful Brain by my my son and I and his father did the illustration. So it is a family affair. And we also have the brain plushie that you can get with the brain as well. I'm excited for your inner child's book, Miss Ann. This is yeah. next. This is I I'm 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 saying this over you now. <laughs> it could be like born to create. For the little, you know, <laughs> this put it on the universe, Janine. All right, it's. Uh, uh, I'm it's waiting on. for it. It's on. <laughs> I love it. Oh. I'm waiting for it. So before we leave, here's a quick snippet about Alumni 360. We're celebrating our 10-year anniversary of students who are empowered to do exactly what Anne book, Anne's book is inspiring people to do. They're born to create. Check, check it out. Entree 
Sports Camp. Are you excited? How many of you all have ever had an idea and thought, someone's probably already doing this? Right? Okay, this is good. This is good. So basically an entrepreneur is an artist, and what that means is you design a world that only you can see, and then you have to manifest it to the world. All right, so that was one of the entre uh, arts camps that we had, the entrepreneurship and arts. We're always trying to combine them. <laughs> um, and um, and yes, so does your sound sound work? Okay, good. I yes, want to sit in the classroom. That, that looked amazing. I, I yeah. was wanting to be there in that space. <laughs> yeah, well, we should, if I had known you back then, you probably would have been a presenter, <laughs> right? So if we ever launch it, we did have a boot camp uh, last summer. So I, I totally forgot you're in LA, or I would have uh, pulled on your 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 shoe shoestring. Like, are you free? <laughs> um, but yeah, we had some great great speakers. Um, uh, Jeff, Doctor Do Gloria, um, Chance, and um, just Vaughn, who's coming out with her book on curiosity. I, did you meet Vaughn? Vaughn? I don't or, know. Which, I have. Yes, Vaughn. I, I was like, maybe she could have been the reason why I know you. I forgot. We met on LinkedIn a while ago, I think. Yes. Um, yeah. Yes. So we have to definitely support one another. And she's launching her book on curiosity in the next few, few weeks. Your book on creativity, uh, mine on intercultural creativity. We're just trying to tell the world like, hey, pay attention. This is where it's at, and we need to make sure we are encompassing all of our faculties. So before we sign off, we are the gems, right? The diamonds. This is our logo. Everyone's meant to shine bright. We are multifaceted. We are prismatic leaders. Miss Anne, what is a final gem you wish to leave with our audience? Well, I think when you mentioned creative confidence, it really struck a chord. And it is in my book that focusing on our creative confidence, having the courage to put our ideas out there is so powerful. Um, if there's one thing I leave your audience with, I hope it's that, that you, you can be creative. You are born to create. It just takes a little practice. So uh, we can all get there and the world needs you. We, we've got some big problems to solve and it's going to take creativity to solve them. Yes, The world needs you. You heard it from first time author, creativity expert, international speaker, <laughs> <laughs> and mother of the year, and probably a cool wife too. I have to talk to your, your husband about that. But um, yeah, mother of the year, creativity expert of, of the year, and author, I'm just saying author of the year. She said, the world needs you. So I hope that resonates in your heart. Thank you so much for spending your time with us. I, I see we have some people who stayed with us the whole time. So thank you so much. Time is the most valuable asset you have in order to which be in order to be creative. So we thank you for spending the 60 minutes that you can't get back with us. So we hope you got a few gems because you you lent lent it to us and we just celebrate you. We celebrate your creativity. Please go check out Anne and her inf information. And then you can check out my information on cafestrategy.com or janineletford.com. We, we have uh, different, different things there. Thank you so much. Have a beautiful, beautiful Valentine's Day when we're actually recording this. You are loved, you are creative, and you are meant to shine. Have a great rest of the day. Bye-bye. Thanks, Janine.